Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Radio Free XP podcast. Today, I'm joined by Jesse Alford, and we're going to talk about a book. I'll let Jesse introduce it in a few minutes. Um, just as background on the podcast, Jesse and I were co-workers at Pivotal, and we just, as he states, we love talking to each other. And so we love to talk, and we love to talk about esoteric books. So today, we'll talk about Blindsight. As a brief note, what we're doing here is building a friend catcher. We know we have many friends in the XP community who want to talk about tech and we want to talk about tech too. But we want to start this ball off just by reconnecting with the people who are in the XP community. So Jesse, with that, I'll turn it over to you for you know your introduction on this. Yeah. When I came to Pivotal, Tony was my first manager. And we have worked well together and talked about things well together and had sort of the same, I don't know, like intuitive response to a lot of things for uh, a long time since then. And that it, it leads to that type of valuable, surprising, but familiar conversation that I strongly associate with uh, a healthy workplace, I guess. This is like, oh, Coworkers who like each other and are on the same frequency and on the same page, this just happens. So we're trying Agreed. to we're trying to have that again and to give our strong desire to explain things to people <laughs> and outlets <laughs> to people who who are who open are you know wanting that right. This is a, a very both ways sort of thing. We explain things to each other all the time. So I'm really looking forward yes. to explaining things to you for an audience and having things explained to me in front of an audience. <laughs> uh, it's so it's so great. I, I love it. Right, let, let's just jump right to the book. You have done some back end research on Blindsight. And so fill in our audience on that. Okay, so Blindsight's a science fiction book. It was published in 2006. The author is Peter Watts. It's part of a series that I think is, is technically called Firefall, though you're not going to see that on the jacket or anything. There's a third book in development, but it who knows when or if it'll come out. So it's Blindsight followed by Echopraxia, which is a sequel that we're going to be working kind of hard not to talk about or drag into this. The books are conceptually dense enough as it is, which is what why we have this, why we chose this to start with. So we can talk some more afterwards about where you can find this book. Uh, it's, it's like it's commercially available. You can buy it on Kindle, but it's also available at rifters.com under a Creative Commons license. Uh, I think there's an audiobook, but I can't. I, I should have been sure about that. There's anyway, for sure an audiobook. I listened to the audiobook. One thing I'll say about this is uh, two. I think there's two important things besides that sort of uh, bibliographic information that people should know about Blindsight and Peter Watts. Blindsight's a mean book, and Peter Watts is the type of author who puts very painful experiences as vividly as possible onto the page and sort of deliberately amps them up for effect. So, you know, I, I'm going to recommend that people read this book, but you should know what we're talking about. This is, this is sort of a broad trigger warning. This is the sort of person who his reaction to one of his pets dying is to write a strongly evocative post on his blog about the subjective experience of, of dying from something you don't understand with yeah. So like it can be upsetting. I don't think I, the conversation here will be too upsetting, but no. th th this is the thing I want to say about blinds. It's very, very conceptually dense. And it's hard science fiction, and it's it's kind of mean yeah. to its reader to make a point. Um, and then the other thing is we're not going to be avoiding blindsight spoilers. I, I have a sort of a spoiler rule myself, which is don't take away an experience that someone would value. So, you know, there are things like the sixth sense where you're taking away someone's initial viewing. Right, they'll have access to the subsequent viewing forever, but they'll never have access to the viewing before they knew what happens. And if you take that away from them, that's not good. There's nothing like that with Blindsight. There are a lot of reveals, but it doesn't add a special tension, I don't, I don't think. It's confusing and complicated and deep enough that the first reading isn't like benefiting from not knowing exactly what happens. But still, it is a good book. There's tension in it. So... If you're like, oh, I've been meaning to read that, you could stop now and go read it. I read it yesterday. It took about eight hours and, and then come back. 
but we're not avoiding spoilers you're, you're, or tagging yeah. them or anything. Yeah. If you're a person who loves a visceral experience, this book is deeply visceral in, in every possible way. So, which is really funny. Well add to the trigger warning. Talks about it as being talky. He seems yeah. talky and <laughs> slow. So, you know, authors get the weirdest feedback and, and it gets lodged in their psyches or whatever, but, you know, it is talking. There's a lot of talking. Some of it's very visceral talking. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, let's kick it off. So we agreed ahead of time because we could talk for, we literally talked about this book for three hours yesterday. And so what we agreed is we're going to pick three main concepts uh, to highlight as, as why we think people should read this book and what they might take from it. Yeah. And I tried Jesse, to write, go first. Yeah, yeah sure. I, I tried to write down a list and we can go through and alternate through a top three, but I think it's going to be really hard. I think there's just this whole other section of honorable mentions that we're going to need to get into. But let's just sure. make sure we cover the three first, and then I'll start breaking our rules and just see how far we get. But wow. my first one is, I think this is the thing I use from this the most, this, this concept from this book that I find the most useful all the time is that useless communication is an attack. That Receiving a signal that doesn't provide any value to you is a metabolic attack. It wastes your resources. It wastes your energy. It's a hot, it's an act of war. And I think about that a lot when I'm reading my email. <laughs> right. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I, I'm just sitting here nodding a, a thousand percent agree. Okay. What's the next one? Well, are we going to alternate? Let's see. We're alternating. So yeah, if we all, one hey, of the then you go now. Yeah. Uh, he, all right. Here we go. So the the first main thing that I take from this book is this concept of the main character, who is called a synthesis technically, but the pejorative, semi pejorative street name is a jargonaut. And can, I mean, I so identify with this notion of being a jargonaut. The whole premise of this is that you know everyone has heard that you know whatever only 15% of your communication is actually the words you use. Well, this book just takes that seriously. And people are trained to read the other 85% and then to write reports on it. it. In the book, they relate it to a Soviet commissar as a kind of half joke. Um, so I love the whole idea of being a synthesis. I think it describes my experience in the world. And echoing your whole thing is that a, a bad or useless communication is a it is a waste of resources at a minimum right and so i would definitely say that so the synthesis thing is really interesting to me our our protagonist or narrator it's hard to tell which exactly we're looking at here what like is there a protagonist i don't know we we, we don't need to get into that our narrator though is is a trained synthesis and he is neurodiverse in a couple of ways one of them is that he's got he's had a surgery to remove half his brain to resolve seizures he was having and the other half of his brain is full of useful implants prosthetics to to press his remaining half of his brain into double duty so when he had this change he had to become able to run a lot of social processes that people that you know uh, that autistic people will talk about holistic people just automatically socializing or or reacting to these things without being conscious of them he has to be conscious of the unconscious communication patterns and relearn all of those and the scripts of society and things like that and that's sort of his background as this type of character so i think that that's the the synthesis thing also builds in a lot of immediate like oh here's what you get there's a trade-off right away for being conscious of and having to be conscious of a bunch of things that people are unconsciously interpreting all the time i, right, I also yeah. want to say about the the commissar point his fellow crew members on this first contact mission that they're on have his the one that is friendliest with him gives him the nickname of commissar and it's not really a joke. He is the the key thing about jargonauts or uh, about synthesis is that all of these crew members that he is doing synthesis for slash two, and it is something he's doing to them, and they resent it. Is they cannot be understood. They're enhanced. They can't be understood by baseline humans. 
So baseline humans are in political control. And they have these instruments, these agents that are so far beyond them in technical ability that they cannot understand what they're saying or what they could do, or if they lay out options, the political people can't understand it. So the synthesis, yeah. it's not just, oh, he's you know creating information. Access to that information is control, right? That commissar presence is like, oh, you're there so the bosses can tell us what to do, even though he's not giving orders. And even though he's not in a position to, he wouldn't be translating the orders the other way back. But his presence, just understanding these people, feels to them like oppressive authority. And I think Agreed. that that's yeah. a really interesting insight about this of like people who are operating out at the edge of capability do not necessarily want to be legible. That's the, so let, let's go right to because that goes to my next point, which is essentially the, the baseline humans invent or genetically, you know, create a class of people called vampires that are full sociopaths. And, and they are their behavior and reasoning is mostly inscrutable to people because they're just operating at such a high level. Uh, this is such a strong foundation of the book. It's, it's insane. And, and thinking like a vampire and, and the whole host of freaks. So the thing I really want to say about that is he, Peter Watts, deeply imagines the post AI world and all of the things that we might do simply falling away is valuable. And the freaks and the vampires are all an attempt to stay at, as, as close to human as possible, but still function like a vampire or in this case they talk in the next book they talk ex extensively about networks which are ai networks and in this book they allude to the ai network running their mission but it's not front and center um, right they have quant yeah. Yeah. quantal computing uh which there's a classical and a quantal mode for their ai that's on their ship and it is right. it, it has to turn off the quantal part for various interference reasons but like Clearly, AIs are thick on the ground on Earth. There's one running the mission. It, it's not... I'm trying to figure out how to say this. It's not... At some point, he says the only reason that they are here is that no one has optimized software for what they're trying First to do. Contact. First contact. There's just no... Which is what the book is about, right? There, the aliens have arrived in the system and sort of introduced themselves very cryptically. The, the first event is the thing the series is named after Firefall, where they drop a bunch, they drop a grid of iron meteors over, over the planet and it takes their picture is the, the phrase they use. It, it, it's this like sensor sweep of the whole planet. And so once Earth realized, OK, someone just took our picture, they go out and try to figure out where in the system are are these aliens and, and what do we need to do to relate to them? And that's what this mission, the book is about this mission that's going out to uh, to make contact. Did I skip your second one? Did you get to yeah, it? That's okay, because you introduced vampires. And my second one is about the vampires, because there's all this hard sci-fi stuff in here. There's all this fascinating, detailed, real science-rooted justification for things. Peter Watts is a ocean biologist prior to getting into writing fiction. And... The vampires are a genetically resurrected, like a, a Jurassic Park style, uh, genetically resurrected ancient predatory cousin of Homo sapiens. O obligate carnivores, obligate human eaters. You can call it cannibalism because there wasn't wasn't separation enough to call, say that, that there's a species line. And they have all these great characteristics that make them really interesting in terms of being savantic and uh, being able to see both sides of the Necker cube. And that's, that's my number two, this concept of, so there's a Necker cube. Maybe we can get a visual up of it. If there's a visual version of this, or people can just look it up, but it's a classic cognitive optical illusion where you can, there's a, a gray panel that you can see either being behind or in front of a line drawing that is, is, is of a, 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 like a wireframe cube. And there's, your brain can process it as representing one way or the other. And if you look at it for a minute, I can switch between them, right? I can get one 
and then I can, I, and it takes me some practice to get back into it. I sit there being like, yeah. Why, where's the other one? I can't see it. But then I figure out how to see it and I can switch freely between them. But the vampires can see both sides of it at the same time. They're capable of holding multiple, mutually exclusive, multiple contra contradictory visualizations at the same time. And I have used that as shorthand for the power of that. And this is really impactful. This isn't just something about them that's not important. This is one of the right. the ways that we are that an expert is explaining to us how smart these creatures are and what the implications of that are, because being able to can actually hold to actually cognitively multitask. Right? We talk about multitasking. Right. You can't do it. It's well known that what you're actually doing is alternation, and that alternation or other even less orderly swapping can be really inefficient and expensive. Alternation's great, but multitasking, switching between things when you you aren't admitting that that comes with a cost, is a expensive thing to do. And it's something that when we're right. taught about how to manage ourselves, we're taught not to do it. Vampires don't need to. They don't need to worry about this. They can just go ahead and multitask. Like vampires are what if you could multitask on top of, you know, if you were significantly faster at processing, et cetera, et cetera. But that yeah, concept it, of being able to see both sides of the Necker cube as just a shorthand for being able to see more perspectives is something that even if I have to use alternation to do it, I think about a lot. It creates a lot of leverage. It 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 puts you inside of the loops, right? It, which is a concept from yeah. somewhere else. Observe, orient, decide, act thing the, the from fighter pilot doctrine. But yeah, I I I love that idea because you what what really anticipated what it was going to be like when there was massive intelligence available for free everywhere. And the vampires are an expression of war, actually. The baselines are losing against everyone else. And so, and so they invent vampires, essentially, as a super weapon. And it's super interesting to just think about that world, because we've hit the AI knee here. And in the next 10 years, it's going to accelerate away from us in a way that's, that, that this book actually draws wild dystopian, unbelievable verisimilitude is what i would say it's like you could see everything in this book happening from what you know right now that's what yeah, part of the reason set, just yeah it's set in 2082 right it's written in 2006 oh. and it's set in 2082 and right before this i was going and looking at some amas with watson and he was talking about someone asked him that seems really soon for all like wow the icarus uses this quantum antimatter yeah. This quantum antimatter based drive and it, there's, you know, the Theseus, the ship has is, is being teleported quantum specs from a satellite array in around the sun that gathers energy and then uses it to tell the machine how to synthesize specific antimatter. And it's like, that's insane. That's that's 80 yeah. years, you know, 75 years less now from when you're writing. How could how could that all happen by then? And Watts said, well, everyone, I, every science fiction author has had this experience of writing something that's set 10 years in the future and then finding out that it's now, right? Or right. You, just, things, he, his first series, the Rifter series, was under, set underwater but was also future science fiction. And he said it 50, 60 years in advance in, in the future. But the things in that book that he thought were 50, 60 years out have, hap have started happening now. And he, he learned from that and tried to set the most aggressive timeline that he thought he could imagine, that he could be comfortable with. Mm -hmm. And he still thinks maybe he didn't, you know, with, with no in years of hindsight now, he still thinks maybe he didn't set aggressive enough. <laughs> yeah, we won't drop in. I won't drop into the cheap intelligence argument but when intelligence becomes incredibly cheap all these if it's physically solvable and economically reachable it will just simply be done right and you know this is a, this is a side note this is not one of my three things about the book but this setting with corporate driven sociopathy and simulation like people plugging in the notion of economic redundancy where fields of endeavor are ruled redundant and then the people are just 
put on support. It's a post scarcity. It's a post scarcity dystopia. There's environmental damage. It's not an accident that much of the second book, the action on Earth, takes place in a desert because that's what most of the world is in in this setting. But this is not the focus. This book manages to have this really detailed background setting as sort of like, okay, well, that's just kind of what will go on for my space story. And I think that this is uh, really one of the things that is maybe most striking in a general way about this book is it's got all these scientific concepts and science fiction concepts and all this futurism that is not the point. It's crammed down and it's like, okay, science fiction setting with incredible versatility and attempts at foresight and accuracy. That's not what the book is about. We're not going to spend time on it. We're not going to explain it. We're not going to, that's just there. And then on top of it, we're building this actual story. And I, that's one of the things I really appreciate about it. And one of the things that gives it too much depth to discuss, right? Where we have to really. Yeah. yeah. But, For the listener who's a fan of William Gibson, imagine how Gibson simply just drops you into an environment and then makes you spend a qu quarter of the book figuring out what he's talking about. Blindside is like that, but with like hyper detail it's just so the reason that we sit and talk about this book is because it pays back a reading no matter how many times you've read it and so yeah it, it is a fantastic book and we recommend it like so let me let me get on to my third thing which is a directly relevant it's just an observation about people and cognition this book is full of recognitions about cognition that's actually a major reason to read it as Jesse says, you can you can take a vampire's model and while you can't do it like them, you can start imagining what it would be like to work in 12 dimensions and then be, start to be good at it. So the vampire that's the nominal captain of this ship, he has a computer interface. And the computer interfaces he use, uses are rendered in human faces. And when a crew member walks in and looks at that screen, all of the faces are screaming. They're, it's all terror and agony on these faces. It's directly designed to appeal to the vampire. And, and he points out that this interface is meant to take advantage of the one third of your brain that, that processes human facial features. And so if you just map all kinds of details about ship telemetry and system status and everything, to this face, you can express multiple dimensions just in this one face that you are highly biologically and evolutionary optimized to read. When I read that, when I originally read that book, which, which probably was 2008, 2009, I'm like, in computer operations, I'm like, everything should be set up like that. How come there isn't that? There is actually a JavaScript face model thing where you can attach uh, real data streams to these things, but they're very crude. And they're totally, they're just like smiley face level, but man, oh man, I've always wanted that interface. Yeah. So he talks, he, this book has both in the book and on the website associated with it, extensive references and appendices, because a lot of these things are based in studies. And so this whole, how many facial characteristics are there Thing and how much of your brain is dedicated to studying them. He has footnotes for those. And I can't remember the exact numbers, but it's when the vampire is describing the thing, he says that each of these faces has more than a hundred characteristics, including like jaw length and it, not just affective things, but morphological things that all correspond to data. So they can all, all vary within their ranges. And I think his ability to take in a giant grid of information this way is also meant to be an expression of the just the raw intelligence that it would take to make actual meaning out of that kind of really complicated, really deep mapping. But it's one of a number of different ways that people in the book are shown coping with too much data or too alien data. There are characters who have their enhancement is a different route of putting data into like into the five the classical five senses so they can taste x-rays or hear radiation because they can wire the sensors into their sensorium and then they go out and they inhabit these sense systems so the vampire doesn't have this yeah. but he's still using the sort of 
evolutionarily justified gray matter to to process something that it that has been developed at faster than evolutionary speed he's he's consciously repurposing his own capabilities to accomplish something else and that that also sticks with me that's like okay obviously things are developed systems something jerry weinberg used to say things are the way they are because they got that way so we have the cognitive systems we have because we got this way and when we are facing new situations it's often not the situation that got us that way modern life is very different and we are constantly rotating and applying and and figuring out how to use these inbuilt systems for fast moving circumstances i think about that a lot yeah you said yeah you said rotate there so I, there's there's two things i want to say off of that which is the book is so detailed and jesse points out the end notes justifying and citing things but the book will not allow any science fiction thing won't, it won't allow any science thing to go by and point out when cunningham who's a the ship's physician scientist breaks down the technical at the at the genetic and biochemical level of what an alien can and can't do it is it is a it's a stunning i i call it what magnification like this thing thinks like no it doesn't it doesn't have any it doesn't have any of the mechanisms of thinking right and it turns out that that's an important part of the book but he at least gives you the best rundown, which turns out not to be entirely correct, but he gives you the best right. rundown of it. Errors. Right. Yeah. There's, um, there's a ton of nervous tissue. There's a ton, ton of um, neurons in these things, but they are shapes as such and so full of sensory organs that his initial read is, sure, you can have all this neural tissue, but it's all going to be dedicated to motor control and sense broadcasting like there's nothing left for intelligence and you know the 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 error he's making is not understanding that neurons could be configured to do different things at different times so the the efficiency of it can think with its sensory system while it's not using it to process sensory input it can think with its motor system while it's not using it to move uh, or where, where it's not using it to coordinate movement. And so that becomes like this horror drop moment when they realize like, okay, well, yes, it's it's so full of neural matter that if it was all a brain, we'd be very terrified of how smart it was, but it's pro- it's using all of that for sense. Oh, no, it is that smart. <laughs> right, yeah. The, 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 so Watts, Watts here does an amazing service to all of us he uses two examples, both from both from these medical scientists, what I call hobby horsing, uh, an expert's hobby horse. So some naive person, Siri Keaton's like, well, why is it like that? And he's like, well, you just don't understand. And here's exactly the neural path that all of this would have to take. And he in this expert absolutely climbs up on a hobby horse and he rides it around and proves to the naive person that absolutely their naive thought is naive and meaningless. And, the, and he does this multiple times in the book with these people because, anyway, I read that as a cautionary tale to experts. You know, certainly at Pivotal, we, de- we, we focused a lot on a certain kind of expertise, and I would find myself overfitting that expertise. And mm-hmm. the fact that this book has such a clear and multiple examples of an expert overfitting and making critically wrong decisions is just another, when Jesse mentioned this book is very, you need a trigger warning. Like this book stabs you like a lot. And it's a stabby book, book, right? And you realize, oh my gosh, I have gotten on this expert's hobby horse and like quelled things around me and I was just wrong. And so, uh, yeah, this book doesn't, if you, if you ask people who read it, like, does this book teach you anything about humility? The first pass answer is like, no. But if you read it multiple times, this book is like, you should be really humble in the face of what you don't know. Like, really humble. Yeah, and this is something that I find really interesting about this book. It, and I couldn't get this on my list. I couldn't figure out how to say it in the way that I would put on a list. This book helps me, it's not a concept, but this helps me understand layers and fractility i guess there's just a lot of things happening 
in layers that reference to and reinforce each other. So we, you just used the phrase stabby to describe this book. There were uh, When I first read the book, I did not understand. It has a series of climaxes at the end. And one of the climaxes, the vampire captain of the crew, for reasons that are hard to understand, that are co co conceptually extremely complicated, stabs the narrator in the hand, like with a knife. Why? Why does he do this? Why is this? I don't understand. And I, you know, yeah. I, I read it yesterday and I still kind of struggled to understand that part of the book. So that stab. I have an answer. I, I do I too. An I do yeah. too. I, I'm curious what your answer is. I suspect it's the same, but I had to work to get to it. But one of the things that I think is really interesting is putting in the text the I have to hurt you for you to pay attention to this. I have to hurt you for you to be listening thing that Peter Watts clearly believes and is doing to the reader. He right? He's like, I need to hurt you right now. And so I'm going to depict something painful or uncomfortable or or whiplash you around or let you be confused because that's what I'm doing. That's what I need to do right now to to have the story be the way like have the effect I want it to have. And so to both do that and then to in the book explain this concept to give an example of like okay and it he doesn't relate the things explicitly in the book. He just lets them be there. There's no translation or transition between the things, but it makes it found, feel profoundly integrated to me that his authorial style, there's, a, there's no more autobiographical fiction, especially this crazy space nonsense is obviously not autobiographical, but I feel like there is a ton to, to see about Peter Watts in this book. <laughs> that he has yeah. communicated it better than he ever could by writing about it directly. Yeah. All right. Well, let's hear it. What, why does Yuka Tarasti basically slice his hand open between the joints from the palm all the way out to the knuckles? That's what I actually happened. Gonna, I said we weren't going to need a trigger warning, but I was wrong for this podcast. So he, stabbed, he also has a robot shoot him. I don't know if you caught that. He also like that he he get, gets shot by a laser or something along the back. He gets burned too. Oh, so that's right. He it's not enough to just hurt him or just put him on purpose it. maliciously. Yeah, right. He he needs him vividly mutilated. So my short answer for why he does this is that he is he has been trying to keep Siri from making a realization about what the crew's hypothesis is. And this come, ties into my third point, consciousness as a passenger. The aliens are not conscious. They are not sentient, the crew concludes. And this is... This has very important implications for dealing with them. And it, the vampire considers this the most important information to communicate back persuasively to earth and siri is his chosen vessel for this lesson and he does not want siri to undermine the conclusions which he doesn't think siri will agree with because of siri's intuitions and empathies and predilections and so he has conspired to avoid having him learn this and then created a moment of panic and terror to get siri's consciousness out of the way so that yeah. his, the, the, so that the correct synthesis that he wants, uh, I say correct, but I'm correcting myself too. So that the synthesis that he is trying to set up will occur at the moment of integration of this information. So that's why. Fair. That's why yeah. Why do you think he does it? My, my reading is slightly different. So first of all, without going deeply into it, in Echopraxia, he actually says that fear amps learning it is the most reliable method for amping learning a major part of this book is that siri keaton tries to stay outside of the system he tries to observe its surfaces from the outside without understanding everything that's going on it's a critical part of being a synthesis and what i what i my take would be that saristy is out there and he's like these things are just plainly hostile like they would just eat earth and that's his that's his conclusion just flat out and he's like, 
all of us are going to try to stop it. But I have to have one guy who I can eject from this system to go communicate what has happened here. And I need him back out of the system, like way, way out, because he's become much too close to the system. And so Sarasti ejects him from the system as a prefiguration of ejecting him from the ship to hmm. be the, to be the, he is a synthesis. They're going to download him and figure out what he saw, right? And so Sarasti is trying to exit. He's trying to send a, a time capsule essentially out because he, he's got, it's seven months round trip, light round trip to earth. So they can literally not, communicate in this very tight three, four week time period where they're operating. They just can't even, they can't get anything back. Saristi absolutely knows this thing is a, you know, a species level extinction event. If we're not, if we don't understand what's going on and for forearmed is forewarned is all he can figure out. And he knows he's not getting out. And so, so you take the vampires knowing that fear drives learning you take the vampire knowing that it, it becomes clear in the book, you know, from from Siri's point of view that he is all he's in the system. He talks about not being able to read people, and when Yuka stabs him, he says, "Do your job." That's actually what he is saying to him, mm -hmm. and I believe it's because he's ejecting him from the system with a knowing full well sorry, that, that Siri is the one who's going to be going back to earth and telling the story. Yeah. And I think so, that's part of it too. I think that like that, I think these reads are compatible. I think both things are happening. Yeah. I think that, yeah, yeah. he gives, and Watts gives a bunch of examples of both of these things when they've got specimens of the aliens and they are using the euphemistically described negative reinforcements to study them for communication purposes. They're doing the same thing. This like fear and pain amps learning. So like, this is one of the things where the book doesn't say which thing it's doing too much. It, it doesn't have a ton of handholding. And one of the things where you go back through having all the events loaded up and you say, oh, this one of the things structurally that this is doing in the book is helping me understand a different application of this principle. Right. The, yeah. the it's, And I don't it's. Again, there's these layers because it's helping the audience understand that Sari Keaton is very cleverly built to be an ideal audience stand in and that he's supposed to be observing this thing from the outside, which, of course, this describes the reader of the book. And so things can be done to him that are uh, representative of lessons being taught to the audience by the liter like. What Watts' literary techniques and the techniques of the scientists studying the aliens are explaining each other. Right. The, the succinct way to put it. Uh, uh, in this discussion, yeah, it, it, in this discussion, it's just so clear why this book is so attractive to us is because it is, it, it's insanely complex, but it is consistent across that complexity. So it allows you to do the vampire thing on it and process it in 12 dimensions over 12 readings right like you cannot process it and it, it has so few errors that extremely minor errors are distracting there is an out and out error uh cunningham is supposed to have lost pronoun processing just like doesn't right. know it. uses it pronouns because of neurological damage related to his enhancements and this is inconsistent he doesn't always have this and you know, again, this comes from an ask me anything. It distracted me during the book. I was like, is he doing that on purpose? Is it a sometimes thing? No, it's an error. It's the, the Cunningham's usage of the it pronouns. He uses he, him for Saristai in some converse, in a couple different scenes. And it's just distracting. And that wouldn't be distracting as much in a book that wasn't so tight in, as in, in, in as many other respects. But I think that really stands out to me as an example of like how tightly you can trust the consistency of everything else. That it's like, what's yeah, the purpose it's... in that? Is that something that Siri, is this misinformation or like, is that not actually Cunningham? Is, is this use, being used to express Cunningham's stress? No, this is an error. 
and it's one of the very few in the book. Yeah, I I don't think I caught that, but it, and it, so it didn't distract me. But boy, oh boy, I, I like I like an author who respects the reader so much that they are willing to harm them. Right? That, that, it's a weird echo in the. It's a very weird echo in the book of the the physical harm to you know, doing violence to your ideas, even, you know, back to the expert's hobby horse, right? He's doing violence to this idea that you can be so expert that you actually can prophesy. And yeah. Yeah. And it, it, it gosh, it's just so good. All right. So my last thing, cause we're, we're over our target time, which I, is what I thought would happen, but I just want to call it out here that we thought this would be 15 minutes and it's definitely going to be longer than that. My third thing is I already mentioned consciousness as a passenger. There's a lot of neuroscience in this book and i was really interested to see you know it came out in 2006 it's a book that he spent a few years before that writing and he reads neuroscience papers directly and hangs out with phds and talks with them directly so this is a good illustration of the the delay for pop science in various explainer forms explain blind sight is a better brief on the state of the art of neuroscience in a lot of ways, even then neuroscience pop side books. And I don't mean that too pejoratively. I like these types of things that are, that came out in the last few years. So how emotions are made is one of my personal books that I keep going back to and saying like, this is really changing the way that I think it mentions some other books that I'm reading now. Nothing in neuroscience is in or nothing in blind sight is incompatible with this cutting edge neuroscience that is being explained in a book published a decade later. And he's he's very careful about it. One of the things that he finds very difficult, he, again, in the Ask Me Anything, he, he talks about how ideas that he thinks are cool, he can't make it into a book because he can't find enough scientific support or he reads something is like, oh, shit, it doesn't work that way. OK, well, that's right. out. So the, yeah. the fidelity to neuroscience possibility, at least, right? He, he goes on to state that things that are like definitely the case that are fringe theories right now, right? That sort of thing. But like keeping that envelope of possibility is really important to him. And one of the things that they talk about is this consciousness. People think that their consciousness dictates their actions. There's a lot of bizarre stuff if you believe that, it's hard to explain. You decide to move, they give an example in the book, you decide to move your hand, but oops, if you're measuring the signal, by the time you've made that decision, the signal involved in the motor motion has already traveled halfway down your arm. So the consciousness is explaining and experiencing and processing in parallel other circuits that are not running through the consciousness that are not gated by the consciousness that are not managed by the consciousness. And even if you change your mind or decide, Oh, I'm going to move my arm. Actually, I'm not going to do that. You might think, Oh, that's the consciousness saying, wait, I'm not going to move my arm because there's a hot plate out there and I don't want to touch it. Your consciousness is not necessary for the decision. Don't touch that. It's explaining it afterwards to itself almost so this notion of consciousness is as something that's sort of riding along with and potentially providing some occasional services to but mostly getting in the way of and and or wasting cognitive resources is a specific angle yeah. book has right oh consciousness is an expensive dodo like luxury not everyone agree. People who read this book, people who really like it, don't necessarily agree with that. Watts was like, well, you know, I figured someone would trash it, uh, that like scientists would, would show me. And they haven't yet what consciousness is for. There's some hypotheses that I find maybe plausible. But people who, it, you know, happily, it doesn't seem to have gotten in the way of enjoyment of the book. People who don't buy that conclusion that consciousness is, is wasteful, nonetheless, they're like, well, yeah, okay, consciousness is outside the control loop. All right, Jesse and I have had a wide-ranging conversation on Blindside and into some of the pivotal aspects we like. Jesse, how would you wrap this whole thing up for the listener? What, what do you want them to know on the way out? If you haven't read Blindsight in the last couple of years, you probably would benefit from reading it. And I say not just if you haven't read it at all, but if you haven't read it in the last couple of years, this absolutely bears rereading. 
and it's much deeper and more interesting and more full of interesting conceptual information. There are not very many books that I reread regularly, but this is one of them, and it it is valuable every time. Uh, I'll I'll just echo all of that, and I'll say if rereading it, knowing what we know about large language models and AI coming up, it casts the whole book in an oh, entirely realistic yes. light. So I crossed this out actually as my number one in order to replace it with useless communication as an attack. But the scenes in the beginning where they have established verbal contact with this thing, and they're getting the first round of conscious not conscious is pitch perfect llm they're communicating with the aliens and the aliens are talking back with them and they've got these this brilliant l linguist and scientist communicating and going back and forth talking with this alien and they come to the conclusion that they have not made any kind of meaningful contact or exchanged any kind of useful information because they are talking essentially to an LLM defense system that its only purpose is to tell them to stay away and buy time. And it knows all this, you know, terms of language and it says all kinds of things that, but it's not really parsing or understanding what they're saying. It's just responding to it. And this is actually kind of hard to grasp. This is hard. And there, there's a line in there where they're saying, well, language isn't language and intelligence aren't even all that correlated back on earth. It's this like, in passing line that one of them is talking about when they're trying to communicate about this. But again, 2006, they didn't even have like interesting Markov chains to play with out there, but chat GPT watching it work. The first thing that came to mind was that scene of where they're initiating radio contact with Rorschach. It's, it's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I'll stick with all of that here. Here's what I'll say from, from a, from a step back. Blindsight is the kind of book that most people do not read because it it's much smarter than you. The book is the book is an artifact that's just radically smarter than you the way it's constructed. Your mind can't it's consume. much smarter than Peter Watts. It's not that Peter Watts is smarter than you. It's that he is very smart and he spent a long time concentrating an artifact that is smarter than you, right? And yeah. used a little yeah. privilege to put it there and so on. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, I regard you as one of the smartest people I know. And the fact that we're both confused by this book makes me feel good, right? It's like, okay, great, right? It, 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 if, you know, if you're, if you're happy with where you've reached intellectually, a book like this is a, is a challenge to that happiness. Like, okay, good. Let's see what you got. <laughs> and there are parts of it that I haven't even talked about where, like, I didn't find that his relationship with his like his flashback relationship to a woman he was dating on earth i was like what is this is this like to give us some emotional depth or like the first time i read it i was like I, these interludes i don't really get or i think they're an attempt to be literary or dramatic subsequent reads i'm like oh no this is doing the same thing he's doing everywhere else he's introducing and re-illustrating these concepts in different settings to help us understand because it needs a lot of ostensive support to explain and show and reveal these themes. And there's a lot of very smart stuff and very applicable stuff, and it's translating it into another domain that people will have personal experience with and be able to connect to. So like, yes, it's very smart and it surprises me. Like when I change and come back and read it again, I get different things from it. And that's the mark of a, a really rich a great text. book. Yeah. 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 All right. Well, that's Jesse and Tony's book report on Blindsight. Go read it. As a as a program note, we're following a model called Friend Catcher here. And so if you like this and enjoyed it, if you know Jesse and I from you know our pivotal thinking, we, we will be rolling around to that. But we want to do a bit of production beforehand. Honestly, it was like living in Shangri-La to work at Pivotal. And we know that many, the pivotal diaspora, they don't, they have no access to that Shangri-La. And my intention is to give you like this little taste of what happened in the kitchen at Pivotal before we get to what happened at the desks. So thank you very much for listening. Go read Blindsight, give us feedback. And consistent with our friend catcher, we'll be setting up a mailing list. So if it's not here directly, check with us. Uh, yeah, and we'll, we'll get we'll, it to you. figure out how you can give us your email address so that we can send you email that you want.
Correct. All right. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Jesse, thank you very much, man. Uh, it's so great to talk, and, and uh, I appreciate it every single time. So thanks yeah. for agreeing and, and joining. No, it's been great. Thank you.